Upon this battle depends the survival of Christian civilization. But what does it mean for the language to be pure? Or when people say they want English to be pure, what are they talking about? Is Shakespeare pure? I mean, uh, in fact, uh, every stage of history, language, there is there is even such thing as a language. There are lots of things that are speaking that different people have. They will still say, this is the language of the And welcome to episode number six of the Everything Keys. I am John, and I am joined again today by Nathan. We are going to be picking up where we left off in chapter three, section one, um, where Dialave begins to give not really his uh, take but mostly Court de Geblin's take on the signs or glyphs or characters. And uh, I'm going to be adding really what my take is as well, um, so that you're going to get pretty much, I think, a, a pretty well-rounded understanding here. Now, I'm I'm not really going to include very much the uh, the Masoretic definitions of these things uh, because you, you can find them anywhere. They're all over the place. Um, but we're going to see how far we get with that because examples are are really key, I think, to understanding these characters. Uh, before we start that, though, we had never got to how much digging into this whole mystery of the word at which is actually the word that, of course, he uses to represent the sign. And he calls the glyph or the character the sign. And he uses that word to represent it. Now, at is a very, um, it's a strange word. I think I had said that, that that's one of the most common and misunderstood words in the Bible. And I still stand by that. You know, you can find at uh, listed under Strong's H226 as a u ta, or you can find it just under a ta in Strong's H853, 854, 855, and you'll also find it with the feminine ending in 857, 859, and with the un suffix in 860. Uh, and a couple of these examples, uh, and we're looking at something that's actually translated directly as a noun. Uh, <clears throat> so, before I start going with uh, uh, kind of laying out those examples of this prolific sort of mystery word, um, was there anything you wanted to start with or add or, or get in there, Nathan? No, not at all. I'm probably going to do a lot of listening today. <laughs> okay. Yeah, no, we're we're at a, a point where there's uh well, it's a lot of technical stuff and Yeah. It's actually a lot of technical things that that I haven't resolved. It, just to be really clear, I'd hate for anyone to ever get the wrong idea. Although I'm able to read the Hebrew when I read it, virtually every word I come across, I have the, uh, the I'm, I'm faced with the chore of knowing that many of these words are, are translated anywhere from two to a dozen different ways. 
And we're talking about words that oftentimes have exactly the same glyphs to them. Um, so it takes, it takes a, a very long time, I can attest to, for somebody who's trying to understand this separate than the, the system they have for us. Um, because there's just so much to comb through. So I'm really doing my best to give give Nathan, give everybody listening as much insight as, as I've been able to gain so far while being completely honest with everybody and saying, you know, I don't have some, some special um, exalted knowledge of, of these things. It's just that I spend so much time uh, looking at these things and drawing uh, uh, you cut out did i for how long um five seconds uh oh well i'll just repeat it real quick it it was basically just just setting the the stage here maybe it'll it'll pick up on the skype recording because i didn't cut out to me hopefully that doesn't continue to happen um if it does i'll i'll edit it before i i send it out so there there it is um you know, I'm trying to get through this as much as anybody who is now getting more interested in the language, understanding the language for various reasons. Um, so, you know, hopefully, like we've done with so many other topics now that we've been given the Internet, um, we'll be able to learn from one another and get this thing figured out because, well, like the the title of the show uh, suggests, I think that understanding the language and therefore the culture, the landscape, and everything else about the Bible is going to fill in the knowledge gaps that we have more than probably anything that we've got our hands on today can in a very universal way. It seems that you know, we're, we're struggling so much with bits and pieces of a lot of different things, oftentimes in many different languages, and putting them together into one concise, unified, coherent picture can be very difficult, where in here we have so much in one document, in one language, that covers the span of a great deal of time and covers so many categories. So... Here's the weird thing about at. Now, I'm going to tell you what I, I've got a feeling it is in, let's just say, in its uh, typical grammatical usage. Uh, I think that it is, in a sense, like a general preposition. And I really do believe that that's where we've inherited our modern day word at from. There's a number of, of Obri words uh, that people might be surprised that we have inherited uh, today even that have, uh, that have survived all of these years. Uh, words like, uh, well, let's say roots like uh, yilad, ulad, talad, lad, meaning uh, to have a child, to sire, or a child, lad. Um, words like the, the root yish, so the e and sha, um, when you can extract it from the words that it's buried in, because it doesn't have its own strong entry, you'll find out that it's very similar to, uh, the word, um, ea, which that sort of means was and is at the same time. It's sort of past and present tense together. Ish is very similar to that. It can mean sort of being or is. And I think that's where we inherited is from. There's a lot of words like that. But uh, since I think Strong's is, is one of the, the most horrible things that's ever been thrust upon us, <laughs> apart from the fact that we just have it coded with the King James Bible, and there isn't much else as far as standard uh, codings of these words go. That's what we've got. And I'm horrified that that more scholars aren't uh, just disgusted with it, but we'll work with what we got. 
it looks like the most of the general usage of this at is like a general preposition. And I'm going to illustrate the the weirdness of it. Uh, and and hopefully this will give some insight. The the first time that you see at in the Bible is in Genesis 1-1. Now, this is at under the listing of H-853. Keep in mind that it is, of course, also listed in those other examples that I gave. So somewhere in the neighborhood of seven times, about seven times. So this is 853, and it's kind of one of the most prolific of its listings. And I think that it does the job at showing us at least uh, this form of it. It appears in Genesis 1-1. So a lot of people are familiar with that, right? The English translation, in the beginning... God created the heavens and the earth. Now, that's the English translation. Now, in Obri, it would be Bereshit bara aleyim at ashamayim u at aretz. So, the at is directly before the object. If we're talking in, you know, modern English uh, grammatical terms. Now, the thing is, it would appear that that right away that there was a relationship essentially between the subject and the object. But when you start comparing the rest of just Genesis 1, you'll see that there's kind of an oddity to where it appears. And I haven't been able to examine enough of the Bible because it appears so much. So you really have to compare a lot and you have to compare it in a lot of books to know for sure. So the weird thing is now you get into uh, verse two. It doesn't appear at all. No, verse two uh, is where it says that uh, the earth or the land actually, Aretz, Aita, Teu, Ubeu, it had become. Uh, without form and void, there was uh, hashak, darkness over the face of the waters, and so forth. In verse 3, here's the thing. We have an action in verse 3 um, that is basically like a present tense action. It says, uiyamur uh, aliyim iyei aur, uiyei aur, which is to say that he said, um, light be and light be. There's that EA. It actually seems to work both as a past and present tense uh, being. It's it's a verb. Huh, so it's so not, yeah. Cook it so that it is cooked. Kind of like that. Yeah. It, it yeah. It, it, um, it does have various forms. Um, like, for instance, in verse two, you'll see it as um, um, Aita. Which the reason you see it like that is because almost whenever you have that feminine end and with this uh, with this word, sometimes you do. And the, the thing is, Strong's does blend these together a lot. And I haven't been able to really parse that one out very well. Um, it does have a lot of different forms that it takes. But the weird thing is, if you see it just as in its I, I think its most natural form is like this, the EA, which I believe the root is actually A. And that E at the front is demanding the action. But what's weird about it is that it, it literally does say that he says light B and light B. <laughs> that's, that's pretty much exactly what, if you had to mechanically translate it. It, w it wouldn't have a different form of that word. It would just, it's the exact same form. And that's probably a good example of what I mean about how there, there, there isn't a direct, there isn't really a direct way to translate a lot of this because the words, they're not, they're not exactly like our modern, um, way of speaking and way of understanding the, the way that words work together and phrases work together it's different than that. 
I think it's actually a lot more dynamic than uh, the way that we speak or understand and use language. Um, so it does appear again in verse 4, which is weird, because he did speak and something happened. So that's, that's a real action um, on something in the sense that he spoke and this happened. Now, in verse 4, it says, U ira, which they tend to translate as uh, he saw, but it would be far better to translate it as an acknowledgement because the root ear is often used for uh, somebody being uh, fearful. Um, and if, if you just understand it in context, it it's usually pointing to acknowledgement. So, He's he's acknowledging the light, and it says, U ira aliyim at e aur, and the hour is the light. So you have that at now being put into to a verse where an action is happening. Um but speaking is an action, the verse just before, and it is not used. And for the next uh, the next two verses are speaking verses. Uh, verse five, <clears throat> it says, Yikara, so he calls something. Um, this is kind of like naming something. And the verse after that, uh, again, it's Iyamar. He says, no at, no at for the subject. And you don't see it again until verse seven. And in verse seven, um, he makes something. The, the word that's used is um, Iosh. So, Uiosh Aliyim at a rekio. Now, the rekio is uh, the firmament. So, he is making, when you see um, Osh words, it, they have everything to do with, it, with physically completing something. And there you have the at. But, after that, you have almost eight verses in which he's either calling something, like the next verse, Yikora Aliyim, uh, La Rekio Shamaim. So he calls the Rekio heaven, and so on. For the next uh, five verses, he's saying or he's calling things, and the at is not used. And it's not used again until again we see him physically making something in verse 16, Uiosh Aliyim at. Shani uh, emarat. So he's physically making something again. The um, it's actually the the luminous bodies of the heavens. Now he's he's making. They're using the the term for making. So what I thought was so weird going through the first couple of chapters of Genesis here is that when he's speaking. The at isn't being used. And and these are actually describing commands being used to put something in motion. So it's still an action. But that at tends to not be used until something more visceral is taking place, which is so strange. Now, I so did go... Go ahead. Deeds, perhaps. That's... That's the way that it, it, it kind of seems, is that, well, at least in Genesis 1, it's those things that, yeah, they're, they're more um, <laughs> friction, you know, something against something, um, as opposed to, well, I guess words, commands, and things like that, they just, they just don't seem to merit um, that ought. Now... One second, and I'll be in the examples of um, of chapter two. Give me one moment. Now, in chapter two, uh, it starts with the first occurrence is with, again, um, it's a blessing, actually. So, he blesses, uh, let's see, blesses the day. 
the seventh day. This is where he blesses the Sabbath. So there's a blessing, which is really weird because I would look at that as something, again, that was speech-related, like Amr um, or Kara. But it inher- it, the blessing gets that. Um, and then again, let's see. Then we see it again in more visceral actions, um, like, for instance, in verse... Two five. Um, let's see. With the Adam uh, to Obed, that's right. He um, there was not an Adam, right? I know Adam to serve Obed at uh, Adame, and Adame is uh, typically translated the soil. So again, it's something more visceral. So I just I just wanted to give a a real broad sweep of how odd it is, uh, what contexts, just in the first few chapters of Genesis, because when I'm trying to figure out anything, I'm going to go back to the the very early source texts, and just like D'Alevé, cha- you know, he translates the first 10 chapters of Genesis, and see what I can make of it in that. Um, as far as, so there's a few different words actually used for speaking. There's other words used for sound. As I've gone through this, I cannot find in these these first chapters anything that um, that attaches the at to, to something that's, you know, a spoken until you get to chapter three. And chapter three is the narrative with the uh, the Nahash, who deceives uh, the woman. Um, and you have the at being uh, being attached to hearing, for starters, in in three eight, and then by three ten, you have it uh, applied to speaking, emmer what we didn't see. In Genesis chapter 1. And then after that, it gets kind of crazy. Because there doesn't appear, I'm not saying there isn't, but there doesn't appear to be this this very consistent application of this very strange, mysterious word. Um, could it, could some of it be um, the scribes? Maybe. Uh, maybe. I mean, I've seen that with various words where some words that I would think should be in passages aren't, where certain books um, have oddities to them that I thought maybe shouldn't be there, but they're there. So it's possible. Now, here's the strange thing about at, and it sounded like you, you might have started to say something. Oh, I'm just as far as sentences not seeming right, um, that's like Russian with the double negatives. I'm not not going to the gym today. Okay. They, they always issue these double negatives for the Cyrillic languages when it's in written form. So it's an issue of syntax. But I, what verse is you're talking? Uh, Genesis three one, three eight. No, I was just saying the first time that that odd appears um, in three was As three eight, spoken, and the first time right? it appears, yeah, the first time it appears when it's applied to something spoken is not until Genesis three ten, uh, I believe, unless I missed something. And I don't think I did. Well, here's why. Because besides for the commands in Genesis 1 and Genesis 2, there isn't a lot of speaking at all. Not not a lot of dialogue in that. But by the time you get to Genesis 3, there is. There's a good deal of dialogue uh, in that. I do think it's actually very strange, though, um, throughout Genesis 1, that most dialogue verses... And it's not really dialogue because it's just speaking. You know, he's speaking these commands or he's naming things, so on and so forth. Um, None of them seem to uh, get that ought applied. 
And I think that's, that's worthy of note. (laughs) Um, yeah. Going further forward in Genesis, because there's again, not a whole lot of dialogue before mm, probably about 12, 13, um, just taking a quick look at some of the uh, some of the passages that actually have the at in it, let's say starting in Genesis 14. Um, I am not actually seeing, no, I am not seeing a lot of speaking. And, and the words you'd be looking for is like um, iamer, be looking for kara uh, with the Q, kora, um, uh, debar, which is more like matters and sometimes can be words. But I'm seeing, again, mostly visceral stuff. Um, uh, yeshab, which is often translated as dwell. Um, I think it actually should carry with it this idea of growing, like uh, like being planted and growing, like a shrub, shab. Um, what else? Again, nope. Uh, iutsa, so that's kind of to go out or to proceed. Um, and again, not as much. Like even in Genesis 15.5, we do see some actions from subjects to objects. Um, like, uh, let's see, for instance, even in 15.5, it appears as 8.53 two times. Um, and it is not applied to... Ooh, nope, it's not applied to speech. Again, we have somebody speaking... And the the action of speaking, um, it doesn't have it applied in. So it very, very rarely is it applied to things that have to do with speaking. I would actually be interested in running some filters on... Any of these entries of at, and and this is one of the problems, of course, with Strong's. Not only do they parse out words that ought to be put together, but they separate words. Um, not separate, I'm sorry, but they put together words that should be separate. They, they s- screw us both ways, really. Um, so a lot of these instances of at that are spread out between... H226, 853, 854, 855, even instances in like 859 um, or, or 857, those ought to be probably more together. And without belaboring uh, too much those instances of, of at as in 853, I did want to point out that in these, uh, these other entries uh, where it appears, of course, the reason that Dialave uses um, and and he doesn't use the the biglyph. He uses the triglyph a, u, and ta, um, which we do have to consider is possibly a bit different than at. the The weird thing is that sometimes it seems to be used in the same way as the biglyph at, but it's appearing as that triglyph. Um, out. Now, when you see it typically as out, it's going to be translated as a sign, a mark, or uh, a token. Um, in fact, um, that that's the very word that's used for anybody who's familiar with the incidents of Cain and Abel and him murdering his brother. And it says that Yahweh set a mark upon Cain or Cain. That's the word, out. Um, When we get to, say, 854, then it's going to be, and we see this again, I believe, in, yes, in 857. They're very similar, except 857, it's listed as ate with that e sort of feminine ending but it's used in a really similar way. Um, in 854, it's often used f- 
they'll translate it as sort of from, um, sometimes with, uh, or in, but when you look at it in the text, you can tell that it should be used in either a way that's very similar to the 853 at that we were just talking about, or sometimes as the 857 ate. And this is interesting. The 857 ate is often translated as like came. Um, he, he came with 10,000 saints. Uh, he, he came with the heads of the people. Um, I greatly, what I greatly feared is come upon me from Job. Uh, in a few years are come. And the, the interesting thing is within the text, let me see. I'll, I'll click on the first entry of it. In the text, I don't know that it actually is all that different than all of those examples that uh, we were just looking at of its usage when listed under H853. Um, like in Deuteronomy 33.2, and again, th this, is the, um, this is the entry of, what is it? 857, sorry. Ate. So, in here, they translated it oftentimes as, as came. Um, and the funny thing is, you could kind of see it in the same sort of generic prepositional way as its usage that we saw it under 853. Let me see if I can give kind of a good example w without it being too confusing. Um, we'll say something like... Um, Genesis fourteen sixteen, um, Uyishab so so to dwell at Kol, um, Erekash, um, Ugam, and also at uh, Luth. They're basically they're saying that they they lived or or dwelt in a certain place and in the art is being applied. So from action to um, object. And this was kind of the same thing we saw in, in those other verses too. I know I was putting a lot of emphasis on where we don't see it as far as like speaking verses, but I should have maybe put more emphasis on the fact that we see it so often when we're looking at some sort of action from um, an object to a subject, and oftentimes it is preceding the action word itself. So going back to uh, the ate, which is 857, very similar thing. Um, you're going to see it in Deuteronomy 33 too, where the, the English says that... Um, he shined forth from Mount Paran, and he came with 10,000 saints. Um, in the Hebrew or Obri, you're going to see Ma'er Parn, U'ate, Ma'rababat, uh, Kadush, and, and what you're seeing there is from Er Parn, and then you have the U'ate, and then the, the word Ma'rababat would be like the 10,000, Kadush. Uh, separate ones. Um, it's actually being used in a very, very similar way as 853 in, in sort of what you could call a, like a generic preposition. It seems to be in a way pointing towards, but I almost hate to use that word that, you know, that it's pointing towards, but it, it, it does have the function of a preposition very much so. The really weird thing about this is that if you look at Strong's H855, about one, two, three, four, five, about five times that word as at is translated as a coulter or plowshare. Five times. And is that that is actually <laughs> Let me get this right. The glyphs actually say at during that time when it's translated as a plowshare. Yeah, if you see plowshare or coulter in these these five examples and I've I've uh, I've checked them um 
to see if they work grammatically, and they do, and you're seeing that word at, and it's translated as, as plowshare. Now, a plowshare and a coulter are not exactly the same thing. They're a different part of the plow. Um, but they're basically meaning about the same thing. It is that, that it would be that part of the plow that would cut into the earth, the metal part of the plow. So if we think of the older mm-hmm. plows that had the wooden handles, and then they would have um, usually a, some metal pieces to separate the, the, the two handles. Um, and then they would go down to where they would have a, a blade and a uh, like a vertical a vertical iron knife piece uh, in there too. Oftentimes the simplest ones, the simplest ones might just simply have that iron cutting blade. Um, And basically the part of the plow that cuts in is what it seems to be referring to, because in all of these verses, we see like it first appears in first Samuel 13, 20, Um, and in English it says, but all the Israelites went down to the Philistines to sharpen every man, his share, his coulter, his ax and his mattock. Um, now, so, so in the attempt to, to understand and codify, um, this is like the, the term for, uh, hammers or building materials, um, kind of a catch-all word whereas others may be incredibly specific this is at least in this sense this seems to be a catch-all phrase it could very well be i do think that what it is is something probably metal but i could be wrong um like check it out in in the other few verses that it's in like uh first samuel 13 21 uh, yet they had a file for the mattocks and for the coulters and for the forks and the axes to sharpen the goads. And I'm going to go there real quick. And um, like Maharishi it is translated as mattocks. Um, at is coulter. Uh, the forks is shalush. That's interesting, too, because here's what's weird. The word <clears throat> shalish is three now did we ever talk just a little bit about how i believe that the obri numbers are probably used because the objects they're reflecting so commonly have like for instance uh shanim is the word commonly used for two but the best usage for it in common language is is as tusks so you gotta always have two tusks right ahad The common usage or the root is hod, and that's blade. You usually see blade, and that's very much a good example, real-world example for uh, for one. And, for instance, uh, for four, arbo. So that would be, um, oftentimes you'll see it as a verb for, for crouching on all fours, spread out crouching on all fours, to lay in wait, arbo. Um, And you could see the four in it. So there's a number of of numbers like that where there's this this real world common example and you could understand why it would be related to those as numbers. So mm-hmm. it's interesting that they translated shalush as forks. Um sometimes you'll see shalish the the word for 3 as as shalish depending on uh whether they're using it in a cardinal or or ordinal example. But I had to throw that in because I had not noticed that before. Uh, and then I'm an idiot. Pitchforks. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, pitchforks. Right. Um, and I mean, I've seen a lot of actually uh, um, table forks that had just three prongs. Um, yeah, they were, they were two and three before they were ever four. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I mean, we still have some forks here that we use for various uh, things that have two prongs or three prongs. I guess just everybody kind of sees them these days with our culture as like a, a table fork has four prongs and maybe um, a meat fork maybe would have two or three. Yeah, a but, meat meat is two and um, vegetables and the like are three. Mm-hmm. It's just yeah, and, a kitchen thing. And then, you know, a lot of pitchforks have like four prongs. And I think I've even seen five prong pitchforks. It depends on um, 
probably depends a lot on on how you're using it and do you need it to be you know close pronged or not but you know like a trident um obviously a uh, trident would have the the three prongs so um and that's the first time i've noticed it if they're on if they're on a river or the ocean that is their fork yeah yeah that's really interesting that's a, just the first time i've noticed it see i i find out new things every day but those those other words um they're probably uh just as arbitrary as ah, I want to see if we actually one example can be nailed down a little better. There's Isaiah two four, and uh, in English it goes, "He shall judge among the nations and shall rebuke many people, and they shall beat their swords into plowshares, their spears into pruning hooks." Uh, now let's see here because we have the plowshares part and the sword part is harab. Now there's it's kind of interesting <laughs> with with Harib. Um it could it could actually be referring to a broadsword because of the characters that are in it. It is translated a lot as sword. Um it's also translated a lot as um to uh well how do you sometimes What's the, what's the the basic King James translation that they'll sometimes use? This is the actually the same word as the mountain of Yahweh. It's Mount Harab. So if it is indeed, huh. um, and it seems to be contextually pretty good as broadsword, you would have to wonder why this mountain was named that. Now, what I meant to to I was trying to think of it, it's used as like. Um, let's say one army um, beats another one and, and let's say they, they beat them pretty badly and, 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 and chase them off or whatever. Th that word is oftentimes used um, and sometimes uh, in the verb form, harib. Um, so there's basically kind of your whole rounded usage of it. But yeah. um, in, in here uh, where it's saying they're going to beat their swords um, into plowshares, uh, that would be, I want to actually make sure that the, the two seem to go together, uh, ooh, at all. Um, well, I don't know. And a meme or beam. Well, there it is. To a team, um, yeah. I mean, you could you could say that, but again, there's there's nothing in there. So it says, um, <clears throat> sorry, uh, harabutam la a team, and you could say that what it's saying is that they're actually going to beat because the the root before that u katatu um, is from the root ke, which usually means to um, to strike somebody. So I guess, you know, that yeah. is interesting. What's um, that? What what is the word katatu? Ukatatu would be uh, a form of of striking. So if if somebody mm. smote, let's say that it yeah. says like this king smote this king. Uh, commonly you would see the word ke. So using the k ke with the e ke. Um and sometimes you'll see it as yik. Uh, we're, uh, which is just applying that action to the K. And we'll actually be talking about that too, the, the K having a lot to do with something um, done by the hand. Um, you know, they, there's the old saying, you'll, you'll see it in literature and actually in some contemporary works too, um, beat a tattoo. Have you heard that phrase? Um. Yeah, well, when they, yeah, what, when they, you mean like the way that they would apply tattoos with the, the no. stick beating or what? No? Okay. Kind of. I mean, sure, that could have some, some connotation, but when you said uka tattoo, yeah. and in reference to smiting and beating and often with the hands, yeah. have you ever seen somebody drum a beat on a table, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, when when people do that, it's beat a tattoo. Oh, that's that's what it's that's that's a term. Mm-hmm. That, that's, yeah, it's a turn of phrase, and I just out of nowhere, tattoo. and it, now, it fits with everything you just said. You know what's really strange too is um, be, because I did tell you I think last time that I think a lot of these words are, um, and I hate to pull a new one out here but onomatopoeic both um <laughs> phonetically both phonetically and idealistically and um so there's the word here we go we got a good word there's the word natan where your name comes from and that means yeah. a gift that's a gift natan mm-hmm. Oftentimes, though, you're going to see this root and i love these these double glyph roots you'll see tat so just the ta followed by ta. And they'll oftentimes try to say that that is, is also a form of giving or gift, but I'm not entirely convinced of that because of the way that the ta oftentimes covers the eh, the feminine eh. I think there's something really interesting and poetic to that. But um, I don't know if, if the double ta in this word has anything to do with the, the many appearances I see of it or not. But here's the weird thing. So in this verse, it's really hard to say, but we do definitely see that something is being kind of beaten or forced in some way or another into another thing. Uh, and still keeping in mind that we're we're looking at this word at, which has these really weird sort of um, way, well, Maybe not weird, but but hard to, I think, pigeonhole. Now, the next one is Joel 3.10. And, and again, it's very similar. All these contexts are really similar. Joel 3.10. Beat your plowshares into swords and your pruning hooks into spears. Um, and... Again, we've got the same we've got the same root uh, to that action. It's katu. And again, we're talking about smiting, katu. Um, and here it is atikam. So it is your with the kam, um, mm-hmm. to la. So again, same context, but it's not necessarily proving that it's a plowshare. I would love to see a, a verse in which it says that they were plowing something because again, in Micah four, three, we have they shall beat their swords into plowshares. And again, the ukatatu, um, harabat em, la atim. But it's not actually proving that it's plowshares. So we don't actually have it in context proving that that's a coulter or plowshare. What's crazy is this. These passages that I'm reading here, besides for the first couple, which were in 1 Samuel, where they were taking their uh, at, to the Philistines, uh, they said to sharpen them. And then uh, in 1 Samuel 13, 21, um, they say they had a, f- a file for the Maddox and the Coulters. Um, besides for those, a lot of these are in a context with prophecy. So I think that's a little weird because people ha- have, have gotten this idea in mind of the way things that things are going to be eschatologically. And this has been a big verse for a lot of people, um, this beating into plowshares kind of thing. Unfortunately, we don't have a lot of proof that 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 is contextually what at is in those verses. (laughs) I think that's weird. Yeah, you were saying this is one of the toughest ones to pin down. Yeah. Because it's everywhere and it's very difficult. And and when it shows up like that, just in its plural form, because most of the time, every well, when I've looked at it, except for the first verse, it's been in a plural form. First verse, it's singular, and it appears just as at. The other times, it does appear as atim, um, or there, um, atikam, but it is that same root, and that's bizarre. Um. And I already dealt with 857, how you see ate, it's typically translated as came. And it does seem to be a very, very similar prepositional sort of usage as what we saw with 853. 
Here's kind of an interesting one, uh, keeping all of those others in mind, because they have to have some sort of relation. Uh, even if, <clears throat> even if they were uh, different, and you could use them differently depending on the context and all. the The simple fact is that they do have the same glyphs, and one way or another, there has to be some kind of explanation to why these, if they are in fact different, and I'm not saying they are, but if they were, there would have to be some kind of logical, reasonable uh, reason to why that they're sharing these exact same glyphs. Um, so now we have it in 859 showing up as, let's see, showing up as thou in, in it's actually what it's showing up as is a pronoun. Let's see, like Genesis 3.14, it says, uh, and Yahweh Aliyim said to the Nahash, because mm -hmm. thou hast done this, ate. Now it's being used, it's, let's say this, not used, used is a bad word. It's being translated as a pronoun. However, um, contextually, it could serve, and I'm going to make sure I find it in the text. Yep. Cursed. So it, it's preceded by uh, Arur, which is translated as cursed, and then Makal Ebeme, um, <clears throat> then all or every. Uh, Bema is a real, real weird one. It's uh, it's it's like a blanket term for beasts, but it's it's a word I don't even want to get into. Um, again, though, what I'm saying is it 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 seems to be able to have the same sort of usage as the previous ats as like a blanket preposition. However, they're just they're they're just using it. They're translating it as a pronoun. And, of course, giving it its own Strong's entry to further confuse. You know, how? what would be people's perception of this word um, if they had actually combined uh, all of the, like they do with many other words, many other words that appear as, um, let's just say, a simple biglyph root uh, in some verses? And then it appears with a feminine end, the e eh, in, in other verses. Sometimes appears with um, the un suffix, which is like a diminutive. They'll combine all of those together into one word and they'll say, there it is, it's one word. And it has all of these variations to it. Well, I get it because one root can have all of those variations to it because of added prefixes and suffixes and nuances. However, there are so many examples of words where it appears that it would be um, better if they combined these, these different um, singular entries into one, uh, but they don't. And it doesn't seem to provide clarity, but confusion. Because it appears to me that um, when it appears as Strong's H859 and they translate it often as a pronoun, it could again, contextually, grammatically, be that blanket um, preposition instead of a pronoun. <laughs> now, the last time you're actually going to see it um, without it being hid, in, in other words, because it might actually be hid in a number of entries. Um, the last time you're going to see it just as an at with some kind of a suffix is Strong's 860. It's a good one, too. It appears 34 times, and it's translated as ass, as in she-donkey, not even as a male donkey, a she-donkey. Now, the interesting thing is it does appear in Genesis 32.15, and the listing of that, and this this is what Genesis 32 is a really good chapter, and it's going to be great for when I start figuring out the fauna aspect of the Old Testament. Here's why. Jacob is separating out of all of his livestock a gift for his brother. 
and it numbers how many of a certain female animal he 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 separates for him and how many male animals he separates for him. Um, and the reason being is because there is a science to um, typically how many males you should have to a female depending on what sort of either um, livestock grazing animal or beast of burden or, or anything it is that you have. Mm-hmm. It's in there. So it certainly is something that's used as some sort of animal. It's a tune. Um, that UN suffix again being sort of that diminutive suffix. Um, so whatever this animal is, that un suffix would seem to suggest that it is like the uh, the the root. The the root at um, meant a sign, or if it was used as a general uh, preposition. If, if there was a lot to it that had to do with, um, what's the best way to say it? If the, all right, if the, ah, is, is an augmentive, especially in the superior position. So that's at the front. And if the ta, um, had a lot to do with actually, um, precision, uh, making something precision, like uh, as in a mark, um, would it, would it have a lot to do with um, that animal have a lot to do with some sort of augmentive mark? I don't know if that mark uh, has a lot to do with, with cutting uh, or, or what, but there definitely seems to be a certain amount of motion implied in this word from one thing or an action, let's say, to a subject. So whatever kind of animal might have that as its characteristic, that would actually go a long way to figuring out what this animal is. For anybody out there who's interested in uh, in looking into the flora and fauna of the Bible, um, they they give things names for very good reasons, it would appear. Everything that gets a certain name seems to get that name for good reason, because it it it's descriptive and you can see this in um let's see i believe it's uh genesis chapter 30 i want to say it's chapter 30 yeah it's where basically jacob's children his, it, there's 11 of his sons that are born um it, within this chapter and every time one of the women who bears him a son bears him a son. She gives him a name for a reason. And she actually says the reason that his name is given. Now, this happens actually quite a lot with people. Um, and so you can see that uh, anytime something is named something, it has an intelligent reason for getting that name. It's, it's never really arbitrary. Uh, unlike our language today, where a lot of things appear to be arbitrary. Yeah, that's a fairly recent development as far as names go. What's that? The the them being more arbitrary? Yeah. Yeah. And and we we can see in uh most cultures that haven't been sort of poisoned with that emptiness of names. And I I shouldn't say entirely empty. I mean, like for instance, my name. Uh, my name is Jonathan David. My parents named me after the two men in the Bible, uh, Jonathan, the son of Saul, and David, the second king of Israel, because they were such close uh, friends that they were like brothers. And in English, there's a passage that says it was like their souls were knit together. So, I mean, it's not empty, but the thing is, we don't really know what the meaning of our names is. You know, I don't even know, I didn't know until recently that, that, um, like for instance, David, it's Obery root would actually be dud. Sometimes it's, it's duid. Um, dud is oftentimes used as a term for, um, uncle. And I think it's actually where we derived dad from. It's uh, a term of endearment. Of uh, uh, You know how, like, in South Africa, they will do that as a term of respect? Huh. 
somebody will call somebody uncle. Yeah. It, 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 it they, you don't have to be related to them or anything, but it's kind of like that term of respect. You would say that to somebody if you wanted to show them that you were being uh, kind and respectful, you would say, call them uncle. Right. Um, and it, it appears that it's, it's used in that same way, uh, in a sociological sort of way, dude. And that's the name he was given. And, you know, it can also be used for, um, um, well, basically like, a it's a term of endearment. And that's his name. Um, and then my first name is very similar to your name, Natan. It's it's actually just Yun Natan. Um, and it has that, that yeah uh, prefix. So it's very similar. Mm-hmm. Um, and like I said, it's it's mostly used as as a gift. Literally, uh, when somebody gives something. And it's, it's a positive connotation to it, too, Natan. Um, but that's everything I have so far. On, at, and out. Now, how close those are is another, it's a good question. Because I think I've said this before, when you separate two two glyphs with that ooh, I believe what happens um, is that instead of them directly acting one upon the other, um, they're basically able to act somewhat independently uh, of one another. Let me see if I can give a good example without having to look anything up. Uh, let take dude. Okay, so it's got that middle ooh between the two des. And typically it's used as like that term of endearment, respect. Uh, but but it is used for um, to care about somebody, that that kind of thing. But if you take away that ooh, oftentimes, and you'll just see it as dud with the two des lined up next to each other, it's oftentimes translated as breasts or teats. Now, the interesting thing is there's a lot that has to, um, a lot of correlations that can be drawn between the breasts and endearment close to the heart. But it's not the same thing exactly when you put that ooh between and you separate those glyphs. And that's weird. They always they always mention uh, being held to the bosom, and this is uh, a, a loving or endearing embrace. So. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah. So I mean, that hopefully uh, serves as a good illustration to why um, as important as art is to, to figure out because of how prolific it is, I, I just want to illustrate that it is probably in some way slightly different than when we would see a, u, ta, out. And that's when you're going to see it as a token, a sign, a mark, I'm not saying that they are, I'm not saying that they are night and day different. And the really confusing thing is sometimes you're going to see that a-u-ta out and it's going to be used in the same way as you see the simple at used. Now, is that a scribal thing or was it really meant to be there? The let's just say the aut, the aut instead of at, and they simply translated it differently than maybe they should have. That's a good question, but I do want to clarify that they may not be just because they mix them up doesn't mean that they necessarily should be. And I do think that there is a little bit of difference, at least, between aut and at. So that's my spiel on art. And um, we can, unless there was anything else, we, we could go from that to, uh, to getting into these glyphs and um, de Gebelin's take on the glyphs and my take on the glyphs, because I know that <laughs> would at least take, take the rest of the show to do. What we should probably do then is, is get to these de Gebelin ideas of these signs. We had started last time and I uh, just real quick before we start. Um, 
Uh, there is discrepancies uh, between the 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 sense uh, that maybe he has about them and some of the senses that I have. Um, the other thing is in the book, they're they're written out, and so in speaking them, I'm probably going to give um, the actual Masoretic or or Hebrew name of these as well as um, the Obri, I hate to say name, uh, since I, I basically just use the phonetic uh, sounding of it, and whenever possible, our, our English equivalent when we have it, uh, to get a good idea, because um, I believe that what we have in not only English, but many Western languages, is... Um, we do still have representations of these things in many of the words that we, we use today, even as common words. Uh, there are the remnants of many of these words and um, something that I think a lot of people would find interesting is to take a dictionary and when you get a really good sense of, let's just say, one letter in, in its uh, superior position, so that would be in first position. You basically, if it's in first position, it's superior. If it's in second or third, it's inferior position. But if you find that, um, and you'll see some, some I'm really strong with as far as what they're probably representing. It's really interesting how if you go through a dictionary of, uh, of English words, how many words you'll see that seem to have that sort of sense to it. You can, you can see this really a good example would be to look through S's because S carries with it this idea of curvature oftentimes, um, even, in its, even in its inferior position. Um, the only weird thing about it is with English, English is such a mamzer sort of language, you know, a, a collection of uh, a certain large percentage of of German, whatever that means, because of how many dialects of German there there are purported to have been before it was more standardized, and then with Latin, Greek, French, Italian, all mixed together. So it can be a little confusing. Uh, it's easier to actually look at words that are more uh, pure single source, which I don't even know if pure is a good word for, for those other languages, because we don't know how much those languages have actually changed. So um, I think it's actually, in a way, it's kind of helpful to, to read the paragraph that comes after that list before we even go through it. On page 92, um, he writes, yeah. now, now it must be observed that these characters received these symbolic figures from their first inventors only because they already contained the idea that in passing to the states of signs, they present only abstractly to the thought of faculties of these same objects. But as I have stated, they can fulfill the functions of the signs only after having been veritable nouns for every sign manifested exteriorly is at first a noun. So that is, that is the idea that should be sort of carried along here. And to mm -hmm. condense this or maybe paraphrase it, <clears throat> it's very similar to what I had been saying for some time before I even knew that Dialabe existed. Um, that what these things are, and this is why, um, a lot of people out there who are purporting to teach Hebrew as, uh, a language of signs and they attribute certain, uh, concrete, like for instance, the E, that very little sign that I just call by its, uh, vocalization E. It's called Yad, and Yad, even though I don't think it's pronounced correctly, Yad is often translated as hand. The problem with them using it or, or, or stating that it, it represents a hand 
is they can only make that work in certain words. And they usually have to make it work through uh, a lot of um, gymnastics. If if anybody wants to see a great study in sophistry, get the uh, get the module for eSword. It's uh, it's in like the dictionary and lexicon module. It's the AHLB, the Ancient Hebrew Lexicon of the Bible. This, uh, as well as a number of other books and a very big website, is all purportedly created by one man by the name of Jeff Benner. Um, that lexicon is a great uh, example of how somebody can take these and they they can assert that these signs are representing a concrete thing and then through manipulation they can make almost any word seem to work it gets absurd you you guys anyone who has esword um get that module if you don't have esword get esword if you plan on doing any kind of bible study in in any sort of facet you should probably have esword it's free it has tons of modules that you can get it's so useful it 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 really reduces the amount of searching around that you have to do but what he's saying there is is very insightful Yes, these things, these signs or glyphs, they do have a representation in a thing or, or in a noun, or they have a, a source or root in a thing or a noun, but that doesn't necessarily make them that thing or that noun. And one of the best examples uh, one can cite for that is the fact that none of them can stand on their own as a complete thought. They have to have at least one secondary glyph before or after to make a thought. Um, <clears throat> take the, uh, the M, for example. It can't stand on its own as, as a thing, but it does appear to represent the, uh, the waves or instability of water just in its form. However, it needs something with it. If you put the e with it before it, you have yam, which is typically translated as sea, a, a body of water. I think sea is sometimes a bit deceptive. A collection of water, yam. If you put the e after it, you have me, which is a liquid. Could be water. Um, sometimes it, you know, it, could be urine. It, it's used in certain contexts where it doesn't have to be water, but it is a liquid. But it has to have, it has to have some other glyph with it to actually complete a, a coherent thought. None of these can stand on their own. The only time you're ever going to see a, a glyph by itself in text is when you have a text that has been annotated by Masoretes, because they use certain glyphs, uh, what they say, they use them as cantillation marks, and you'll see that at the end of certain verses. That is not original to the text. Neither are the hyphens that you'll see in those texts. That is not original to the text either. So they start with the um, Aleph or A ah or A. Now, De Gebelin says, A, man, himself as collective unity, principal, master, and ruler of the earth. So that's, I think that's kind of interesting in the way that I've seen it used in so many relatively verifiable words. For instance, the root bod. It oftentimes has to do with something apart. If you were to say, um, this thing happened besides this other thing, you would be using that root bod in some way. Now, if you put the a 
in front of it, you have Abad, which is often quite appropriately translated as um, destroy. Uh, that's where we would get like, uh, for, for anybody who's familiar with, uh, with Revelation, there's like Revelation 9, there's this, uh, this creature or angel from this bottomless pit who's called uh, Abaddon. And it's actually from Obery, it's Abadun. It's got that un suffix with the abad. Bad is the root. The ah seems to be augmentative when it's in superior position. You can see that also in the word abel. If you have bel, bel usually uh, means something empty. And if you add abel to it, it can either mean um or I hate to say mean, translated or used as mourning, uh, to mourn. It can also be used as a, um, translated as a meadow, um, which makes sense uh, in the physical realm that it could be translated as a meadow, uh, a broad, empty place, um, and definitely used for mourning. If bell is something that's empty, um, abel, it, here's the, the funny thing. It seems oftentimes that ah is used for emotion and possibly um, first person emotion. I, I've mentioned that, that ah is the suffix, or I'm sorry, the prefix that's used for first person voice. If, um, if somebody is speaking, and they are going to say they did something. It's going to be preceded by that ah. Yeah. Um, a couple of other examples would be like, for instance, uh, Adam. Uh, Dom is your root. <clears throat> Dom is appropriately usually translated as blood. And um, Adam could um, either be a term of because dame is also used as as likeness it could be a term applied because of the nearness of man to his creator adam um there is there are those definitions that some have given that means it it means to show blood um i don't know if i agree with that or not um, but again, there's a, a good example of the Oz effect um, on a word. There's uh, Adan. So um, a lot of people might be familiar with Adani. The E at the end is a way of saying my or me. Mm -hmm. The root is Dan. And it's often appropriately translated as judge. Um, Adan. Um Again, something that could be applicable to oneself with an emotional element, because oftentimes Adon and Adani are a sort of a term, um, in a sense, like an emotional term, Adani. And I just want to see if there's a few others that I can use that will shed maybe a bit of light on the way that um, ah is used. Now, here's an interesting thing is um, cull, the, uh, the root cull, which is, is usually translated as all or every. If you put the ah at the front of that, a cull, it typically means um, to consume. It can be used as eating, like food, or consumed as fuel, like wood in a fire, a cull. Um... And those, I think those are some pretty good examples. Um, I don't necessarily see any more right off the top of my head. So to go back to what he said, man himself as collective unity, principal, master, and ruler of the earth. I don't know how much the examples I gave um, are harmonious with that. Um do you see any solid connections between uh, Gebelin's assertion and the examples that I just gave in Ah? 
Well, uh, there's so much conflation here. I'm actually having a tough time um, going through these this week because of who de Gebelin is. Now, he, he may be correct, but the man carried the torch of the sun cults through his century. And I just, mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> it's hard to, it's hard to reconcile who yeah. he is with what he's saying. I'm still trying to separate it. Mm -hmm. Aleph being man himself as collective unity. Yes. I mean, to, to bring it into a wholeness or, uh, especially when you said Abaddon or Abaddon, um, mm -hmm. a destroyer of all. So, um, well, here's what, something that's what interesting. I think, I think as all encompassing is the application of that a uh, prefix. Mm -hmm. And so to mean the whole thing or all of it. Um, yeah. So yeah, yeah, I can I can definitely get behind what he's saying. I just hate the guy's guts. I can understand that. <laughs> so it, it makes you wonder why <clears throat> why Dialavaith uh, considered him uh, an appropriate source here. Because some of the things I, that he's saying they're appropriate. If like for instance, if he says like man himself, um, okay, because Oz is used as the first person. Mm -hmm. Um, ah, also seems to have a very strong emotional, um, emotion as in man's emotion, uh, about it. Like some of the words that give you some of the simple words that ah is in, in, in the superior position, like ab father, or, um, how about ah? with the uh with the h or ha at the end a brother or ahi usually it's abi or ahi because there's always the my in there um am mother um mm, ap would be nostrils or anger um ash fire and then we've of course seen at too a number of those words actually have a very strong emotional component and they have a connection to self or speaker, mm -hmm. you know, Abi father, Ahi brother, Ami mother. Um, so just something to note, just something to note. And we, we could probably move through these relatively yeah. quick because we're going to see them over and over again. Uh, now he puts on the next thing he, he puts two glyphs together. He puts the, um, the pe, um, which I also usually call pe, and it's like P and the, um, the Masoretic beat or B or B those two, he groups together. And I don't know, uh, if I'm with them or not in a little kind of way, I kind of am. And, and you'll see why. So he says, um, these two glyphs, the mouth of man as an organ of speech, his interior, his habitation, every central object. Now, the thing I take issue with is for one thing that there has to be so many sub definitions given for those two things. Um, because in some ways, yeah, um, the pe is similar to the be, but it doesn't always necessarily work in the same way. Um, let me see if I can give a few decent examples. Uh, one of the most common would be ba. So that is the be with the a uh, in inferior position. And that always has to do with uh, bringing. Uh, if something uh, come bring always the sense of towards, uh, the speaker or the subject ba always. Um, mm -hmm. and I, I went into a few of these last time. So let me see if I can get, um, bell, which I mentioned, uh, in, in the Oz, um, often empty hollow. Sometimes it's actually translated as not 
um, where the L oftentimes has a sense of like, um, oftentimes I always think of it. If you listen to the guys who are teaching this as ancient Hebrew, they'll say that the L, uh, represents a shepherd's staff with the, um, the hook on the end. Now, in some ways, I actually think that's a, that's not too far off, but it's not entirely accurate. Um, so the, the Beth seems to always in this, in the, in the superior position, be pulling things towards it. So with that, with that L having this sense of, in a sense, like low or scooping, and I don't want to get too far into L, but you could see where bell, where the B works in the sense of always pulling things towards it. I mean, it even has a look to it that is like a space with an open door. That's literally that if, if you were looking down on something and that that's why they actually did mm-hmm. name it beat which the beat is the word for house. Um, of course, in Masoretic, they'll pronounce it, uh, that word is Beth, usually like Bethlehem and all that. Um, yeah. See if I can give a few more examples of the, the be words and then the pe words. Um, because where you have this idea of something that is a space um, with an opening and the things that follow pulling it in, the the pet doesn't have uh, that same sense to it. Um, mm, let me see a couple of decent ones. Um, well, uh, you know, there is bowl and bowls kind of a little more complex, but bowl is often used uh, and translated as Lord. Or master, actually, um, a woman's husband is often called the bowl. If a woman is a handmaid, um, the handmaid or servant of that woman would call her bola with that uh, the feminine eh. Um, it has as its root the ol after the be. Um, the ol as a word ol it's used a lot, and it typically would mean um, up against or or covering and uh with that be at the front again um it would seem to carry with it a at least in the the mouth of the speaker um the again the idea of covering um but inward instead of outward its position is really important because if you see it in a in an inferior position at the end of the word, it oftentimes means outward, the the be. Like when you see it in rub, the the simple biglyph rub, uh, the 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 b is is going outward because rub is more um, translated as as multitude, or multiply, and uh, rahab is um, something that that is very broad whenever you see that b at the end it's usually going outward maybe taking the the uh, the root that's behind it and going outward with it when you see it at the front it seems to be taking whatever is after it and and pulling it inward whether it's pulling it inward uh to the speaker or whatever the subject is that you see before it. So I think that's, that's probably a pretty good uh, characteristic of the be or bit. Were you going to so, say something before I say anything about the pe? Go ahead. Uh, so the, when it's the primary glyph, it is an enclosure more likely. So, or receptacle. Yeah. It's almost like if you, th- if you think of it like a door, like if it mm-hmm. had a door on it, if it's like a box instead of a space, maybe a box with a, with a, with an open door, um, it would seem to be in, in the superior position, pulling things towards it at the front end, you know? And if it's at the back end, the inferior position, it would appear to be, um, stating that whatever that was, that was before it is going outward. 
it would appear to have that characteristic to it. At the front, pulling whatever follows it in. And at the back, pushing whatever was before it outward. I, I think maybe what we're what's, supposed what's to be What's a name getting, for a house? A name for a house? Uh, yes, you said it in relation to this glyph. Oh, um, well, in Masoretic, it's Beth, or in Obri, it'd be Beat. Okay, so, so a house of issuance uh, to and from, based on its position in a word. You know, well, that's Do you what, see what well, I'm getting at? That's what they name it. I don't know if it is. It could be. I, yeah, it could be, you know, like a, a, the sense of a, a dwelling, a space, or a domicile. It could which, very well which, be that. Even if the dwelling or space or domicile is mm -hmm. you. Yeah. yeah. And, and that's the funny thing is even that word uh, beat, I don't know that mm -hmm. it has to, I don't know that it has to carry a house like the way we think about a house with it. Oh, no, know? just, just uh, as a house is a substitute word in this sense for a, a point of origin mm -hmm. uh, could be anything. I mean, you're. Yeah, your body is a temple. There's mm -hmm. there's a house in itself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's you know that word is used in the name of a lot of places. Um, like I said, like Bethlehem. Now they would say that that's the house of bread, but Le <laughs> Lehem is also actually used as war. Um, <laughs> and, and it doesn't necessarily mean that that place is a house, right? Um, but places are often given that name. Doesn't mean it's a house, but again, it's like, uh, like an origin. Um, yeah, yeah, sure. Um, and that seems to be more the sense of the, the be, or as they would call it, uh, beat, uh, or be. And, you know, you're going to see probably the best, uh, representation of the be if in English, if, uh, if most people look at it like a lowercase b, that's probably a lot better representation. Or if you look at it in the uppercase b, uh, think of it as the, the two arches sort of pulling inward, uh, whatever follows it. And I think that because as time goes on, I'm noticing that, that even our modern English letters could almost, as they stand, be substituted for obri glyphs now the thing with the pe or a uh, p um our modern the the our modern p doesn't bear as much resemblance uh if you look at a hebrew pe uh and they call it pe because the uh pe and e together is translated typically as mouth and it's it's a pretty good translation um, and it probably does represent a mouth as in, but here's the, the thing though, where as the be kind of seem to represent a space with, uh, an opening and was sort of pulling things in, in the, the superior and, and sort of pushing out in the, in the inferior position with the pe, um, it seems to more represent an, an edge oftentimes um, and can be lips, sure, in the sense of like pe or p. Um, words like that uh, tend to mean either mouth or smile or sometimes it's, uh, it's translated as beauty. Um, there's a, a real common word that's, uh, that shows up a lot. It's par. And what par seems to mean is, is actually a, an adolescent, whether it be a person or an animal, and it's typically used in like an, uh, an animal. Um, but you could see that as, um, uh, the edge of, um, in a sense, adulthood, I, the R is a real weird one so far with me, um, but there's so often times that that pe um, represents uh, an edge, a lip. Um, I think I brought up paz as the as Joseph's coat being actually it 
the pas would, would mean more of a, something frilly than many colors. Um, whereas, let's see, in the inferior position, there is, as I mentioned earlier, op, um, as in nostrils. And it's also used in anger. I think anger is the abstract of it. Um, and maybe another few good examples of that in the inferior position. Oh, cup. That might be a good one. Cup. Um, that's probably a way better word than yod for hand. Although it's usually translated as palm. I believe cup is actually hand. Because you have the, the ka or k, um, which I think very much is actually the splayed fingers in, in, in a hand a paw or a hand or something. Um, and then you have the, the pet at the end of it, meaning giving the, the sense of an edge, uh, a silhouette, an outline. Um, sup is oftentimes, uh, translated as a, a basin or sometimes storage, um, and so on and so forth. So, in a sense, I guess I could see how he would blend them because they have kind of similar usage and kind of similar look. And the funny thing is they're really similar phonetically because um, oftentimes like a, a bee, if you give it enough time or, or go across enough culture, it turns into a P or vice versa. So they, they got those similar phonetics to them as well. Um, mm -hmm. we're not going to see that with every letter with, with these similar phonetics, having a, a quasi similar representation too. Um, and I don't think we'll, we'll see this with the next one too, because in the next one he groups, um, he groups, uh, ka or K or, um, you know, actually in, in, uh, in Hebrew, it's usually just ka. Uh, with the, in Hebrew, it's Masoretic, it's Gimel, or the G, the G. And he groups these two together. Now, these two are similar phonetically, and this is why I, one of the reasons I developed a similar phonetics list. If you're trying to look up things like the etymology, where these words might have went from what they once were, you have to actually take into account all of these phonetic similarities. So he groups these together, and again, I guess these are supposed to be broad strokes, but he says, the throat, the hand of man half closed and in action of taking. <laughs> That's really descriptive. Um, and then this one really gets me. Every canal, every enclosure, every hollow object. Wow. Um First off, I'm going to have to strongly disagree with, for instance, the G or the G portion of that. Why? Because this is one of the simplest glyphs to find out. And let's just say after going through all of the entries of G to see that it, it has in superior position a whole heck of a lot to do with things that are erect or vertical, like gi or gia, being not a valley, a plateau, or a sheer face. We can see it in gab, the word for shoulders and back, gab. We can see it in gu, the word for spine. Um, we can see it in um, gad, which would be the word for um, uh, like a, like a standing army or troop, if you add an, uh, an air or are at the end of that gatter, it's the word for a, um, it can be used for pen, but more like uh, a gated enclosure. And any, anybody who's seen a, a gate that's meant to keep people out know exactly what I mean. Like these, these vertical members together, gadar, um, it is always used, if you see the, the ge and the ge together, gug or gug, it's used typically as the top of something. 
So I'm, you know, how he's missing that in here and combining it with the ka and the ka again, uh, one of the most common ka words is kal, which tends to mean like every or all, which you would have that sense of like a hand and that sense of sort of, um, how can I best say this? Like, like when somebody wins a hand of poker and they won the pot and they stick out their arm and they scoop up everything out in front of them, bring it to themselves. That's sort of the sense that the L has to it. Um, it does have a sense of, of low, like as in if you were to, to scoop low, oftentimes in the superior position, but it does. It, it works very similar to how it looks. But the thing with the K, it, how, where he's getting throat, the hand of man half closed, I'm not seeing. He's definitely close when he says the hand of man. And we'll see this in a lot of words especially when it's in its its first position or superior position, you're, you're going to see that. Um, and I won't go through, you know, so many of these examples like I did with these before, but just so we can get through all of these in this uh, episode, I'll, I'll kind of go through the rest. The, the next is he puts together the D or Dalit, and so the Hebrews call it Dalit because they say it represents a door, and I'm very much against them on that. And he puts that together with the Ta, or it's called Tab in Masoretic. So they're the equivalents of our D and our T. Um, the breast, every abundant nutritive object, all division, all reciprocity. Now, combining those two glyphs again is either uh, very um, irresponsible or deliberately deceptive. You know, the one thing that, again, can be illustrated with the, the de or d or dalit is that it tends to come with a sense of direction. Which is really ironic that so many of these words, especially simple root words, where uh, D begins, comes with a sense of direction because it looks like an arrow. It looks like it's pointing to something in some direction. And when you see the fact that, like, for instance, the root do, you know, the root do uh, tends to be to know. And it can be to know as in your mind has found something out and it knows. It's used as to know when you have sex with a woman, you know, the D with the O. There is a sense of direction or piercing into the second glyph is an O. Um, it also has in, in let's see, endure. Dur is often used as um, as generation. Uh, again, it has a sense of direction to it. Um, dam. Dam is blood. Just uh, the D and the M. And the sense of uh, direction in this liquid. The funny thing about blood is that um, some physicians who don't usually want people to know who they are um, because as for right now, they would probably get laughed out of, uh, their, uh, little cabal is they believe that blood actually has more of a sense of life and direction to it, um, in and of itself, even apart from the heart's pumping of it throughout the system. Uh, they believe that there's a large amount of energy just to the blood itself and that the heart is not the only thing that directs it. Uh -huh. um, so it's very interesting that D, especially in the uh, superior position, has to do with direction, movement or direction to, you know, point us somewhere. Um, and I wish I could think of more quick uh simple roots because not all of them are listed. Um, Dan, uh, usually has to do with, with judgment. 
Um, and there is a sense of, of direction again in Dan. The problem is there's so many words that will be translated as judgment. Um, let's see. That's all that I can think of just off the top of my head. And I don't really want to scale through all of these, but whereas, like I had said about the, um, the, the ta or the T it would appear to have more of a, um, a sense of precision. Um, some people teaching ancient Hebrew say that it actually represents a mark, uh, sort of like X marks the spot. Um, let's see. And get, I'm, I'm going to see if I can get a couple of, of relatively good examples. Um, well, I brought up tar actually the other day. Now that's a, it's often a three glyph word and I'm trying to stick to two if I can, but, um, okay. So R as a simple biglyph has, um, uh, the idea of like spreading and you'll see that in all the words that it's, it's rooted in. Um, it's, it's actually rooted in, uh, the, a s certain tree, at least one tree. Um, it always has that sense of spreading. Um, and I believe that it's actually used, um, in at least one way as a, a Delta. Well, anyways, when you put the, the ta at the front, uh, tar, you get tar, which is used as, well, it's oftentimes translated as, uh, somebody's figure or form. If, um, if, uh, something's translated that, that a word, a uh, woman is beautiful. Uh, the word tar will be used. Um, so it seems to be a way of making something in a sense, more precision, more exact, um, where the R could be spreading. It's used, uh, in descriptions of borders to tar, um, a course of something. Um, and I, just would like to find maybe one or two more words. I actually started writing some of these down, oh. but there were so many that I, I the could, list would um, have been unending. Could the, the borders, uh, and that ta or tar, um, be the reason why he lumped it in with, uh, with that da and said all division all reciprocity because you said you uh, disagree with with the idea that that glyph is a door or a gate yeah i don't think dalit's necessarily representing a door but i mean mm. there's that sense of direction i suppose so you could see it in the word dalit actually those two glyphs are both in that word dalit which is a door, a actually the word for gate. And I, I don't know if it's a physical gate. Sometimes I think it is a shore. Uh, it's so sha o r, but in this case, Dalit seems to be a door in, in a number of, of, um, trend, well, a number of passages. Um, so at least we know why he lumped them together here. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, just some of those words that he uses, they just don't seem to make a lot of sense, especially like the reciprocity and the fact that he's using, uh, absolutes like all, you know, uh, I don't know. I think it, again, I think it seems a little misleading. That is an esoteric trait. You find yeah. it with all of these occult books. Oh, that, yeah, that, that they do a lot of absolutes. Mm hmm. Yeah. I hate when people do that. This is beyond debate. This is absolute. This is all. Yeah, I, I don't like that at all. Uh, okay, so then he moves on to the the eh, which is usually uh, in Hebrew, it's usually called a he. Um, it's like our modern e. Now, this is interesting, though, that, that he says the breath, all which animates air, life, or being. That's interesting just in the sense that Typically, when you see it in the superior position, it it tends to mean like wide, like broad. It's it's even used to turn a common noun into a proper noun. So instead of just saying like si yam, you could have a eh, yam. 
you're making it now a proper specific noun. But when it's at the end, it tends to soften whatever was before it. So like the placement of these glyphs is so important. You know, if the placement is superior or at the front or if it's inferior at the back, it's always so important where these things are placed. I mean, just like the words in a sentence, you can't mix up the words in a sentence and have them mean the same thing. Um, so, I mean, in the sense of this, yeah, I, I think that that he's actually um, pretty close with the et. Maybe, maybe not right on, but close. Um, and then he goes to the u or the vav or wa, depending on which uh, Jew or Masoret you ask. Um, and that's similar to our modern U. They conflate U and O or U and O all through this uh, book. And it drives me nuts. So for the U, he says the I or all that which is related to light, to brilliancy, lipidness, or to water. Now, the funny thing is, uh, the U itself actually probably only has not even a dozen entries in Strong's. Very, very few entries. Because there are very, very few words that you could definitely say begin with this, with this glyph. Ooh. Um, well, gosh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. It has ten entries, and I'm not counting any that might be Aramaic, and it doesn't appear that there's any. And I would, I would have to almost guarantee you that most of these entries um, are bogus, and this is just uh, the u being used as a um, a prefix to um, whatever. Like, for instance, ulad, while the uh, the root of that would be lad, um, like uh, a, a child, a son, or to sire. Um, so oftentimes, they're, they're misleading. The funny thing about the u is, okay, so it's oftentimes used as a, a way to not only connect different ideas, whether it be a full phrase or a word or two glyphs. But at the same time as connecting them, it's also separating them. Um, you know, it like the old bras, it lifts and separates. Um, I don't know for sure at this point in time. I really don't know it, what it's standing for. You know, the, um, the, the 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 folks out there doing the ancient Hebrew they'll 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 often say that it it's representative of a peg like a tent peg or nail because they're always trying to make this Middle Eastern that's why they it's why they say the G it, it is gimel and it represents a camel oh well, why does it represent a camel oh because it represents its foot what yes it represents the foot of the camel. And and that's why actually in Masoretic the 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 changes they've made they they made the ge which usually is supposed to look like something that is 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 vertical is perfectly vertical um, with oftentimes a hook at the top which could be more arrowed or it could be somewhat ninety degree but I think a little bit of an arrow to it is probably a little more appropriate they changed that into something that looks like a camel's foot. It's kind of ridiculous. So I don't know at this time if this ooh is more appropriately something that's kind of a hook. And the reason I'm going along with that is not what they say, but it's the fact that there is about a dozen times that it appears in, I think, maybe Leviticus alone, where it is translated as hooks. Let me see. It's uh, Strong's 2053. I'm going to punch that in real quick and tell you. It's an exodus, and it only occurs in exodus. And, and it's literally every time it is, it's translated as hooks. Um, um, so their hooks, again, 
their hooks and it's talking about the hooks of of things now it it, ooey, it just hooks um yeah and it's uh, copper hooks brass hooks so it works grammatically contextually it works as hooks and it would be hard to say that those weren't hooks that they were flames or something because i know that dialave and it seems that gebelin both like to assert that there's something about flame to yep. this glyph i don't see it in its usage I, I just don't see it um i do see this as more of a sort of universal connector and separator it kind of does seems like it does both at, at once um and it doesn't seem to have like the life to it that let's say ye has you know where that that goes before um a word and it it dictates that it's put into an action form same as the end does when you put that before a glyph it it dictates a type of action because n has a a flow feel to it but um i should move forward because this will take forever if i don't so the next he again groups the o with the u and he says like the ear all that which is related to sound to noise to wind void nothingness well i don't know i don't know because um the word for uh, ears, I believe, is azen, has nothing to do with those glyphs. The word for here, shemo, um, has the o at the end. Um, if shem is the root of it, uh, good luck with that because there's so many definitions of shem. It's ten tend to use as there to place. Um, oftentimes, it's it's name, um, somebody's name. They could, you could say Shamu, that would be like saying their name, which I think it actually has a lot to do with the fact that Shem is used as location or to place or set something. Anyway, so it's it's in there to hear you have Shamu, but you know, what? So the word for noise, one of the words for noise, cool. So it has a, a middle oo to it. So what? So does a lot of words. This is one of the ones that I'm just not seeing at all where he's going with that. And I think they really throw us uh, a curveball with, with these, you know, sometimes they seem so right on, on some things and so far off on others. A and that seems to be the pattern of people that are trying to confuse. Now, it could be somebody who's just not sure, but um, they're not, not saying these things like they're not sure. <laughs> um, I think that would be more responsible. So the next grouping, the crazy next grouping he's got is the sha with the with the s with the z z or as the the Masoretes would say the shin with the samic with the zion. Um how you get these three together and uh, anyways uh, a staff, an arrow, a bow, the arms, the instruments of man, every object leading to an end. And I have to disagree so violently that I wish there was more time. <laughs> um, I do agree with, with a bow uh, in reference to the shin. Um, well, it's, it's used. Keshet is war bow, but everything else, no clue. It's used in some words that is, that's translated bow. Mm -hmm. There's, there's actually quite a few words that are translated as bow or arrow. So yeah. It's rainbow. Bizarre. Warfare. It's bizarre, man. But here's, so here's the thing. Well, well, here's what's crazy though is, um, all right. So the sha, well, so I'll start with sha. Um, that seems to have everything to do with either growing from or being from the ground. Um, either from, well, okay, so figure like all the words that are like she, like Masha or Moses, Masha, 
uh, the Mitzri woman who found him, they na- she named him Masha because she drew him out of the water. Um, it is the root to what uh, the Jews call Mashiach. Mashiach. It's, uh, so it's um, Shah, the Shah in there. Um, it, it has to do with drawing out often um, this sense of growing from a base or drawing out of Sha, She, She, Show. Um, now, with words like Ash, which seems appropriately translated as fire, and uh, Sharap, which seems appropriately translated as burning. Um, well, of course, that puts a superior with an inferior position word. Let me check real quick. Um, so Shah fire, uh, Shab, that, that's a word I mentioned earlier to sort of grow. Um, Oshib is a word that's typically translated as like, uh, shrubbery and whatnot. So you see that I'm just giving you words that it's typically used in, in, in superior position, um, with the, with the S with what the Masoretes calls would call Samic. Um, again, there's, there's typically that sense of, um, curvature to it. Okay. So like words like sub or especially Sabib would be, um, they, they translated as surround, but it, it definitely should mean to go around. Now, whether it's all the way around or not, I'm not sure. Um, also, like, mm, well, hmm, see some good examples there. Psop, obviously, um, which was the bowl or basin. There was collection. Interestingly, like Sapar which you'll usually see as sefer, sapar, is like recording, um, like a scroll. Um, man, that's probably good for us. Has it, having basically everything to do with curvature, almost anything you could think of having to do with curvature, um, the S is going to be involved in. The Z. The Z is a really interesting one because... Um, I saw it in so many words that seem to have to do with like growing, like, uh, the word Zara, um, what it, it, it's sort of growing Zara. Um, and there's, there's a lot more too than, than just the Zara that I probably can't think of, uh, since I'm on the spot now, unless I look, but I don't know that it's necessarily if it's actually, if it's growing in the sense that we should look at it as, uh, as growing or in, in what do we think of growing? I guess we think of like, um, base or bottom up. We think of like, maybe like a plant growing. I don't Not know beginnings. if that's, it could be. Yeah. Or like expanding it. Like, a it seems point, like it's in a point of origin. Yeah, and and look at look at the Z. Um look at the Z and I don't know you know <clears throat> if it's necessarily supposed to actually have this idea of what would you say like spreading? I it, it's so hard to uh it's so hard so to really put my finger on that. Um let me Z find a few good words. It's completely different now in shape to to the way that it was. I mean, you could invariably take an older Z um, and it's basically half of the wheel of life for the swastika. Oh yeah. I've seen some of those. Mm -hmm. I've seen some of those. Yes. The idea of, of an origin point or progression from an origin point. Yeah. 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 Which, which that could, could have a lot to do with it, actually. Um, <clears throat> let me see if I can get some better ones then. It's used in Zab, like wolf. Um, 
it's used in real simple words, but all of these are used in like simple common words. Um, and I, I haven't a clue a, as to how that happens exactly. There isn't a lot of simple glyphs with the Z, but I'd like to at least give like one or two. Um, now, Zabub, here's where it comes down to the possible onomatopoeic sort of uh, usage, like Zabub. Um, Zabub is like f- a fly, and you can hear the uh, the onomatopoeia to that Zabub. Um, let's see. There is uh, Zabul is like um, a habitation. Um yeah, it would be really hard to say. So, bell bull could be somewhat close to the bell root of being empty. Um, so, I don't know if the zebul would have anything to do with um, expanding into that emptiness. You see what I, where I'm going with that? Yeah. Okay. Mm. Let me see if I can get a few others that that are kind of good because Z Z is one of those, and there are a few glyphs like this. They don't appear a lot. Um, Zabul, that's... Or or Zabel without the middle ul, Zabel, um, is used as um, eh, like one time to honor or exalt and it's hard to prove mm-hmm. um mm, yeah it's just one of those words that doesn't have a ton okay so pride now let's think about that for a second the word z so it starts with the z ends with the de is translated at least 12 13 times as pride um you have the de at the end direction it's also used as zedun so you got that un suffix um and pride so a puffing that maybe that's what i kind of meant to say with with z just it there's so many words that i've seen it in as i'm studying where it seems to have this idea of puffing i mean even a sheep or a lamb is often called a z and they are kind of puffy. Um, you also have it in like words like zeb, ze, e, be, which is translated as gold. It appears a lot. I'm actually going to be looking close into that when I do my metals study. But um, maybe that's just a few examples. We'll, we'll have time to you know, do more in the future. But that was the best I could say on Z. There are a few of those glyphs that I just I don't see enough of enough of the time to have more of a full picture of Uh, the next one he does is the modern equivalent of our H, which is usually called (laughs) Hebrew. The hold on. I want to (laughs) try. Did I get it? (laughs) Just, yeah. So they're gutturals. It's one of their guttural. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, it's like my cat coughing up a fur ball and, and it's like our modern age. Um, and this, this stands alone and he says a field image of natural existence, all that, which requires work, labor, effort, all that, which excites heat. Now that's interesting because that's actually a lot closer than all of these other ones have been. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, the word for life or alive, <clears throat> excuse me, is he. Um, it seems to to carry with it. Okay, so the word for breath or wind is ruh. It has that H at the end. Um, hey, the, the life or alive is he? He, yeah. Uh, In Japanese, H and that's he. fire. He oh, is, is it? fire okay. or flame. Okay. Yeah. There's a lot of, there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of words actually all along the uh, east coast of Asia that aren't all that different than I think these words, these source words. I think there was a lot of words that were exchanged or inherited between the east coast of Asia and the west coast of America. 
But most definitely, um, words, culture, a lot of things. Um, and, and that's where that happened. I think that's why there is a, a certain disparity in some cultures between everybody's got this idea of East being, um, you know, Europe and, and West being, um, or I'm sorry, West being Europe and East being, uh, Asia, the far East, they say, but look at it different. Think about that as being West and the Americas being East and those two cultures being far closer together for a long time than people might think. Um, okay. So yeah, it, it, it seems to be used in a lot of words where there's like a sense of repetition. So the fact that he says something like, um, all that, which excites heat, it is used in a lot of words, things that seem to excite heat. Uh, like I said, it's, it's in Ru, uh, which is actually breath. Um, it does seem to, to carry with it, at least in its, in, in an inferior position, um, the sense of spaciousness, it of course seems to have a, a repetitious feel to it. It's used in like, ahi, my brother, it's used in, uh, Hatsi, half of, um, and it's really hard to necessarily pin down. Um, let's see a few others with that. Um, it's another one of those. It's not used a ton. I'm going to punch it in just real fast. Uh, let me see. Starts at 2243 into uh, a strongs list here, just to give a, a couple of examples, um, of its uses. Well, let's see. Yeah, I did this actually in a word study hob. Uh, for hiding a lot of words with hob, um, let's see, bosom to withdraw, um, habab to love fervently. Um, let me see if I can get something that's a little bit better. Habur, a bruise or stripe. No, no, no. Um, let's see. Habal, habal to bind. Now we just used that ball root in a lot of words. It was in able as um, morning or sometimes as a meadow. And we saw it again in Zabel as um, like a residence or a dwelling. And here we have habal and it's used as to bind or to take. Um, and while they, they actually translate it in a lot of different ways, the bell being sort of like empty, huh? It's also, mm, it's also used as a cord or a rope. That's what it was. That's what I'm sorry, but that's what I was thinking. It's used as a cord or a rope and it's oftentimes, uh, put into a context of a, um, uh, similar to a border. Like a region, something roped off, hobble. Okay, that's a little different because yeah. a, rope, a rope could require work, labor, effort, or symbolize it. And to to take a sort of space or region or thing would be habu. I think ha, um, rope is a relatively appropriate symbol for H. Mm -hmm. Um. Because it's got that idea of of something that is over and over again repetitive, I think that's why it's uh, used in in words like ru for for breath, breathing. I've seen it in other breathing sort of words, um, or um, um, or like he for for alive, um, something that's ongoing, something repetitive. Um, and I can't get past hobble because hobble's got like uh, a dozen entries. But anyways, so moving forward, a, the next one again is a, a, a grouping of uh, the tzad or what they will call the tzadi or, and the, um, well, I guess it depends on what Masoret you ask. Again, this is what I would call the tha. And I think it's got its relative equivalent in the Greek theta. 
um, it's a more of a TH sound. And he's actually, he's actually combining the ts with the th. He says a roof, a place of surety, of refuge, a haven, a shelter, a term, an aim, an end. In the sense of the tha, I'm with him on the sen- uh, the refuge, haven, or shelter. I think that the tha, now it's a, basically it looks like a circle with uh, an X in it. It has appeared to me that it tends to mean something that is like enclosed, protected, um, could actually mean something that is um, hard or tough, depending on the inside or, or on the outside and soft on the inside. And as strange as some of that might sound, but that's the sense that I've gotten from many words that it's used in. Um, I mean, tha is used, for instance, in words like mathe, which is translated as branch or tribe, and shabath, which is translated as staff, stick, or scepter, or tribe, again. Like the tribes of Israel, you'll find that in the two words that are oftentimes translated as tribe. So it it is in a lot of words that seem to be appropriately stick, staff, scepter, things like that, where the tsa oftentimes is appropriately in words like um, tzitz uh, can be like a, a branch or oats is a tree. Um, but it oftentimes in the superior position um, denotes movement. Tsa means to proceed. Um, and Oh, sub, and let's see. Gosh, it's in a lot of words that have to do with movement. Even even the word ruts uh, is typically translated as as run. Except I don't think it should be seen as an action. I think it should be seen as something that happened um, quickly from one place to another. Ruts instead of a an action like run. If you say run, it means an action. Uh, it does have a lot to do with either sa with either moving or growing, but not. And that's why I guess I, I spent so much time on the Z. I didn't want to say that it, it necessarily was growing, but in a sense, like puffing a little bit differently than what a tree branch does when it grows, or let's say that somebody does, if they move from one place to another, that's not the same as like this, uh, this puffing sort of thing that I think the Z more represents. The hard thing about naming these or or putting this representation to them is because you've got 22 characters that have to act as tools. And they are all the tools we have of a, of a complete glyph set in order to express all of these different ideas. So sometimes it's a little bit different, difficult to articulate what I'm seeing when you also consider that so many of these words are purposely mistranslated and chopped apart. Uh, anyways, so, <laughs> so the next one he gives is the, um, the, uh, the ich or the yad. Now I really disagree with, with some of this, the, the finger of man, his extended hand, all which indicates the directing power and which serves to manifest it. Now, part of that I agree with, it definitely is used as a way to um, excite action. If it's put before a simple uh, root that is just an attribute or a noun, it excites action, and it will turn anything into a verb at the front. Um, It is not the only glyph that is used for action. You'll also have the N and sometimes the E or T, depending on if it's a female acting or if it's um, first person voice, you might have the A. But you can count on about every word with that at the front. It is denoting action. So in that sense, pretty good. Yeah. But the, the finger of man and all that. Yeah, I don't know so much about that. Um. Do I think that it maybe represents um, an arm or the sense of, if it represents an arm, 
than it is in the sense of action or strength or power. And that's probably why it animates glyphs when it appears before them. So the next one is uh, L or what uh, the Masoretes would call uh, the Lamed. Now he says this, the arm or everything which is extended, raised, or displayed. You remember what I said earlier about this sense of thinking about like somebody reaching their arm out and pulling in a stack of poker chips. In a sense, it kind of has that idea, like when you see it in words like Galil, which is a region, or Kal, which is sort of everything of a specified group. Um, Also in the words like Al, Al being uh, towards or these, and it's actually the root of Aliyim, which we typically translated as God. Um, it's in words like gal, meaning a um, like a lump or to roll. If it's if it's in the uh, form of an action, it's not as commonly in superior positions as it is in inferior positions. So it's hard to give a ton of examples of it. But it does have that. Let's see. I'll, I'll I'll actually go to it. I'll see if there's a few examples, but um, it doesn't appear to. Oh, it is. Uh, it is actually the. Um, it's a a prefix, and they commonly say that it, it's a prefix meaning two or four. Let me see. Thirty-eight oh eight. Start at thirty-eight oh eight. So you might see something like um, it was. Um, the fifth year, La Dariush to Darius. Um, that's sort of the way it would be used. Um, I don't like to mix two and four. Uh, I typically just, uh, when I translate it, translate it as one or the other. I usually keep it with um, two. <laughs> yeah, and and, and it, it's oftentimes translated as of as well. Um, two, four of that and again that's the problem with with english not always having direct equivalence i mean obviously in its context when you look at it in context with other words in obri it makes sense and and so in english you can translate it because you have to as either two in some cases or four in others or of in some yeah because they just don't have that equivalent it's used frequently in uh, superior position with an a ah after it, la, as not or no. And I haven't figured that one out yet. Um, oh, not of. It's used, well, yeah, that word la, it, not or no, it's used a lot, actually, now that I think about it. Could that be used as uh, as saying not of? Uh, well, uh, well, okay. Well, the, the L would be in first position. So of, and then you would have the on the second position, position, the a, um, I don't know. Like I said, that's, that's one that I, I haven't figured out yet. I haven't figured out why that, for instance, why the L to the A is no, but the A to the L is, for instance, these or towards. Like if if you look at a phrase where it says um, something went to or somebody gave to, you would see Al. Um, but yeah, sometimes you're going to see La as not. Sometimes you're going to see um, Bal as not. It's strange. So it's used in superior position in words like lab, um, being like the inner man. Sometimes they'll translate it as heart. Um, I don't think it necessarily means what you would think when you see it translated as heart. I think it has more to do with the emotions that come out of someone. Um, but yeah, it's got a number of, of uses. There's, um, 
Labouche, like clothing. Laban. Yeah, there's Laban. And again, that's a word that probably has to do with something either excreting um, in the sense of, of lob, or the ben is the sense of building. Just And I only say that because of how often that ben root appears in things that are built or made. I'm not saying I necessarily know why it's used, um, just to be clear on that. So we've got four more. I want to make sure I get through so we can wrap. There's the M. He says, the companion of man, woman, all which is fruitful and creative. Uh, yeah, I don't know about that either. I'm, I just gave those examples of putting the uh, the ich before it. And you have yam, as body of water. You put one after it and you've got me as in a liquid, a juice. Um, I'm not saying it doesn't have anything to do with woman. And he's going to make a contention that we'll probably get to next time, which we can actually weigh and see if he's correct or not. The M is a real interesting one. It's that it's that glyph that if you put at the front of an attribute or action, it makes it a very concrete noun. Um, it, when it's used as a prefix, it um, it it oftentimes is translated as either from, like from the east, makadem, or sometimes than. We saw that in the uh, thing about the nahash was more subtle. Uh, Makal than all of the bema in the the uh, garden. Mashura. Hmm. Um, asura versus maasura or masura. Oh, the from the that one. Mazarites, maasher. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um. Yeah. So that 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 was their contention that it could be that. Ma'asher means actually that something that is from Asher or Assyrian, Ma'asher. Um, so, I mean, that's its, its use at the front. At the back, it, it's most commonly seen in suffixes with the e as an im. Um, and, and, and they say that it's typically a, a masculine plural. Um, we saw that with Atim. You'll see that with tons of words where it seems to be a masculine plural. Sometimes you'll see the M by itself with, with roots and it still appears to be a plural. So that's something that has to be figured out in time because you're going to see a lot less where it's just the M. Oh, sometimes the M is, is at a suffix when it's just speaking of them as a suffix uh, used as a, a pronoun, meaning them or, or theirs also. So that's basically its usage. Um, with N, he says the production of woman, a child, uh, any fruit whatsoever, uh, or every produced thing. Now, I will say that it, it certainly does appear to be something that flows. Something flowing from, you know, source to end. Um, and I think that's why you would see it in words like Ben, which is used and translated as son, but often means a something that is created uh, from someone proceeding out, a creation, uh, a son, um, used The product with, of effort. Yeah. It's, it it's definitely has to do with, with a flowing from one thing to the other. And I, I think it definitely has a lot. Uh, it is important as with anything else, if it's in superior or inferior position, um, it's in words like Nahal, meaning, uh, like a common river or Nair as, uh, like a large river. Um, it's also in words like Min, which means the, the source of something. Um, and it's at the end in the inferior position with Min, um, Face, it's in it's in face, pun or pani, to face um, or be before something. It it absolutely has a lot to do with projection. It's in the word oin, which means an eye or a spring. Everything about this has to do with flowing in some way, you know. Um, and then he goes into the qua or or. Um, well, I think the Hebrew, uh, the Masoretes call that, um, oh gosh, what do they call that? Um, 
that's just cough. They call it cough. And, and they, they pronounce it. They use exactly the same vocalization with Q and K, which is very confusing, which is why typically when I find anything with the, the Q or qua, I pronounce it with that qua sound. And I think that's exactly where we have uh, inherited that, uh, ab that obligatory U always after the Q in spelling because it's supposed to have a bit of a different sound, qua, than a ka. K sound. Um, th they're going crazy with arms here, man, because they say it's a positive arm, all that which serves, defends, or makes an effort for man. And what I see to it is dividing. And just look at it. You look at it, it seems to have the sense of dividing, division, something that is divided. And I'm going to scroll forward. I can't keep up with these. He is giving them an order, but but he's skipping some things here and there. So it makes it a little bit harder for me to keep up here in my strongs list. Come on. It's after it's uh, All right. Starting at 6892 so I can give a few examples of some words. Because I know plenty that it appears in like inferior position, like kibbutz. No, that's actually superior. I'm sorry, kibbutz. So that would be like to gather or a gathering uh, is kibbutz. We have, mm -hmm. this is a weird one, kwa. It's used four times and it is just the ku and the ah, kwa. And it's translated as vomit. Go figure that one out. I still haven't. <laughs> I don't know why that is vomit at all. Wait, um, what is what is the word? Qua. It's the ku qua. with an ah. Qua. It only appears four times and it's translated to vomit. It appears to fit contextually. <laughs> so you have kobab, um, to utter a curse. That actually appears eight times, seems relatively correct. Um, or kwaba. The uh, stomach, belly, or maw that only appears once, twice, a um, couple few times. And then we have kibbutz. Now, it, that appears a lot, and people would know that because, you know, Jews call it those little communist settlements that they started way back when to do who knows what kibbutzes. Um, we have kibbure, which is a grave or burial site, kibbure. Mm -hmm. Um, in its superior position, does it always mean somehow to divide or to divide something? We, well, here we have kwabal again. We, we run into this bell uh, all the time. Um, to take, receive as before. Is that a bell root or is that a quab root? I'm not too sure. I need to find a few of these words where it actually has very much a sense of dividing. Now, whether the uh, the following root or glyph can, hmm, how, how should I put it? Okay, so it's in kibbutz, right? Kibbutz, and it means together. But you're going to see it in other words, and I want to find some of these other words, where it might be in its inferior position, and it could mean dividing. The problem is to find these in their inferior position is much harder because I can't just scroll through a strongs list. <laughs> so it could have the sense of actually combining things at the front and dividing things at the back. Um, but as far as he's concerned, um, a positive arm, all that which serves, defends, or makes an effort for man. I... Don't see that in any words that have that Q. Um, rock. Okay, so rock with the Q at the end. Rock. Um, that actually means thin. That is something that's very thinned out. And there's a lot of words like that that have that qua at the end, which have so much to do with like division, thinning, so on and so forth. All right, the last one he gives is the air or rush that the uh, the Masoretes would call it, or R. 
the head of man, all which possesses in itself a proper and determining movement. So this one is is really, really, uh, this is a tough one. This is a real tough one. Um, it seems like in a lot of words, it has to do with man. It seems like in a lot of words, it has to do with erect in the sense that man walks upright or man is upright in certain ways. Um, and it seems to work if you look at it in words like air, which just eh and r uh, and r or air. Just the word air is the word for mountain. Um, the word rush, I yeah, sometimes rush is is relatively appropriate when it's um when it's translated as head. Um, more than that, though, it seems like it's it's far more appropriate when it's translated. <sighs> All right, so you would see it in Barashit, and the prefix and suffix aside, it, it it's kind of more of a root. Sometimes I've seen it translated as chief. Um, that might be a little bit more appropriate than head. Um, let's see. Okay. So a real common word that it's in is ra. So that's air er and ah. Um, and that means actually it's translated as to see, but I think that it, it actually is more appropriate to acknowledge. Um, there's a bird of prey called a ra'e. Um, and I'm going to have to go and skip through a lot of these because there are a lot of our entries. Um, okay. So rub, multiply a lot, many. It's a, it's weird in the sense that like, um, the, ah, oftentimes seems to be augmentive in a sort of emotional kind of augmentive way. Um, when it's put at the front where R also sometimes seems augmentive, not in an emotional way in, in the sense of like importance or eminence, something along those lines. It, it seems that the, the air or R carries that with, um, let me see if I can, just find a couple of other decent words might illustrate that. Um, rem, reme has again a sense of um, growing. I don't know about heights. Maybe you might say heights in that sense. Um, interesting. One of the most common words that starts with the air or R is ro, which is usually translated as evil. Where, funny enough, Roe is translated as associate. Um, sometimes you'll see it even as shepherd or pasture, that, mm. which is so weird. Um, oh, I just wanted to see if I could get a few others that were decent. Um, I keep thinking of, um, of Midrash. Yeah. And okay. also uh, Ra'el, uh, such as various names, Azrael, uh, Uriel, things that I, wonder, I see, but I, I don't know any any names that are R that you haven't even covered. Yeah. If you see it in something where it's usually Ra'el, it's probably Ra'el, just um, R-A-L, Ra'el. Um, mm -hmm. and I think that the root is just going to be the owl at the end, like Aliyim owl. Um, mm -hmm. I can't really point to a lot that this is another one, even though, even though error R shows up a lot, a lot, it's still one of those glyphs that either, either it's a lot of bad translating or it's a lot of fuzzy translating or it's just a lot of me not really understanding. 
um, because we have a mindset that we've got to kind of break to understand what's going on here. Uh, and it could just be one of those glyphs that's so intrinsic to a very different mindset of this entire language. It could be why. And I'm not saying that it's not because almost everybody, almost everybody out there um, speculates that the R has something to do with man, like that it represents the head of man. Um, but I have seen it. Okay, look at it in when you see it in Greek. It actually looks more like a P. Um, and I'm trying to remember what language I've seen it in where it actually just looks like our sort of lowercase r, where it's a vertical stem with a small horizontal stem it's coming so off It's so strange. It. The, the Hebrew r actually looks like our cursive r, and that's yeah. never changed. Yeah, the Hebrew r just, it, it looks like a vertical stem with a horizontal stem. It just, yeah, very simple. If we're talking about Hebrew, yeah. Yeah, if you were to change any cursive sentence and place Hebrew R's in place of the English R's, nothing changes. Not really. And the funny thing is now, um, R is not ever listed as being used as a prefix or a suffix, but... Um, I think R is one of those glyphs that actually is used as a suffix. And I don't think it's that far off of the way that it's used as a suffix in English or in German. Um, doctor, you know, Fuhrer. Um, and I mean, it, it could be as common as like Mutter. Um, you have that R suffix. It, it, it almost seems to denote, um, gosh, what title. is it? In a sense. Yeah. In a sense, like a, a title, a, uh, a, the, like a thing Commander, somebody does. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Which brings us back to the sense of R as representing a certain eminence. And maybe it is, maybe, maybe it does in, in that sense also can, yeah often represent man that's funny uh, yeah we could just have a simple rule r for role could that's be it. yeah yeah I, <laughs> r could be uh at least in that sense of of suffix and and of course that makes it like you know a, inferior position where I'm still not sure on the, on what it is with the superior position because in superior position you see it in words like ruh, which is to breathe, um, rahab, which is broad or wide. Um, I guess it's just hard to say. Word uh, words that they say are, are run, which would appear to be just a description of moving from one place to another. Not, I don't know if it is an action. Um, rapa to heal rapa a would be medicine. Um, I don't know. So we'll, we'll have plenty of other chances to look through these. And, um, the, the next thing he does within just a couple of pages is actually going through these again in, in, in a, a little bit of a different way. Um, the next thing is is section two, the origin of signs and their development um, for the Hebraic tongue. And um, I know that just having to get through those, you know, that's that's uh, that took us well over an hour just to to get through those. So we better wrap at this point. I <laughs> it was a lot. I knew it would be a lot too because when we we get into these these technical parts, there's so much that these guys can assert that if you don't have a pretty good handle on just a, a real broad spectrum of usage, it's not that hard for them to pass some of this stuff off. And even if you're somebody who actually spoke Hebrew as it's taught today as basically an empty phonetic language, um, they could still pass a lot of this crap 
off on you. So it, it, they're really showing signs of controlled opposition in the sense that some of those things are so um, accurate and um, sharp, and some of them are so terrible and way off. I mean, way off. Like, how many things can you say have to do with the arm? I don't know. But that's about it. Do you have anything else to say or add, Nathan? I am so thoroughly lost. <laughs> I have to do this again and Good more. Good for you. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Not going to lie. <laughs> yeah. Well, then you're in good company because there's, as I said, there's, there's a lot to this. I, I, I'm just not sure of, I would never pretend that I was. Um, and okay. So how about this? Uh, uh, just one thing to, to leave everyone with is that, um, I do think that even with all of the chicanery that, that I've seen in the impressions of these glyphs and the way that they combine ones that probably shouldn't be combined and, and so on. Um, even with all of that, I do think that there is so much truth uh, to be mulled over in what they had to say or, or probably what Dialave had to say about the symbolism and the fact that, you know, we do have, we probably have in every one of these things, a solid representation of something. Um, that doesn't mean that that's necessarily what you're supposed to be seeing every time, you know, that you look at it. If the ka represents an open hand, like with open hand fingers or spokes or rays, um, then you have something that is elemental. You can, you can apply a hand to so many things, splayed fingers, spokes, rays. Um, I think that's more the idea that we're, we're supposed to be getting from these glyphs is that they're elemental. They're elemental. And it seems like every time you add a new glyph onto it, and depending on whether it's coming before it or after it, that, you're adding more detail to where as soon as you put two together, there's only so many variations that you can have. Um, when you put three together, it seems to make it even sharper so that you really can't have that many variations from those three. Um, but when they rest by themselves, I just don't think that there is enough information there for you to you know, definitively say that this is this. That's why I think for a very long time, I have said that they are elemental. I used to call them elemental ideographs because they certainly do have an idea to them. And they, they certainly are pictorially representing uh, an idea, but on their own, they can't for sure be taken as anything in particular. Strange as that may sound to some, I believe that is probably very accurate. And I think that is, in a condensed way, that paragraph that I read before we started on those glyphs. So, Nathan? That actually, um, that actually yeah. helped, that reading that paragraph first. Mm -hmm. But yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it helped a lot. It that's too bad it's at the end because he, he's going to mind screw everybody, you know, and then try to pick up the pieces afterwards. It just, that sucked, man. So, um, yeah, yeah, he got the right idea and, and I think the right idea and the wrong, the wrong way of going about it all. <laughs> so, but we've got a lot of time to to look at these other things unfortunately the next time we we do have these lists again um and you know maybe we'll be able to be a little bit more brisk in there and uh, and move right along so um thanks again for joining me nathan and uh we'll hit this again next time 
And uh, hopefully, if this was painful, it won't be so much as we go on. But repetition is one of the biggest keys to um, not only programming bad information into your head like the public school system does, but getting good information in your head and getting bad information out. So there will be tons and tons of repetition. So, all right. All right. Thanks again, Nathan. See everybody next time. Thank you.